What's your wealth? I'm wealth. Good evening. I'm Joan Bailey, Vice President of Mission and Identity here at the college. On behalf of the President's meetings with us tonight, I welcome you to this evening's program, which continues our celebration of the 475th anniversary of the founding of the Ursulines who gifted us with the College of New Rochelle. Tonight's presentation, Taking Flight, The Holy Family's Flight into Egypt and Today's Refugees, continues to explore the relationships between art and faith and the role of visual art in the endless project of human self-understanding. This lecture will reflect on the story of the flight into Egypt told only in Matthew's Gospel and how it has been imagined and reimagined in Western art from the medieval period onwards. The domestication of the narrative flight portrayed almost as a comfortable vacation will be contrasted with the plight of refugees and displaced persons today. What sort of imagery may offer the Gospels good news of hope and courage to men and women in flight today? The resources for this lecture have once again been the galleries of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Reverend Leo O'Donovan, President Emeritus of Georgetown University and past President of the Catholic Theological Society of America, studied with Father Carl Rahner at the University of Munster. He's written extensively about Rahner's theology, including an introductory volume, A World of Grace. In addition to publishing theological articles in Systematic Theology, he produces wonderfully inspirational and insightful art criticism for America, Commonweal, The Washingtonian, Stimmen der Zeit, and The National Catholic Reporter. Please welcome Father Leo O'Donnell. Thank you very much, Joan. This is the sixth such lecture I've given here, so by now Joan knows me better than I know myself. I'm delighted to be back on this wonderful campus. Uh, I am a trustee, uh, I take great honor in that, of the college, but I've known it since uh, I was a boy. That is to say, when I was a student at Iona School, a little bit on the other side of town. And many of my dearest friends came here to college so it means a great deal to me to come back to the College of New Rochelle. Compared to the elegant, I would say, intimacy of the in infancy narratives in St. Luke's Gospel, which are very important historically, but nevertheless are intimate in the scenes first of the revelation that John the Baptist will be born, and then the scenes of the news brought to Mary that she would conceive a child, and then the birth of John the Baptist, and then the birth of Jesus, and the few scenes that follow the presentation of the temple and the finding in the temple. Mark uh, Matthew's Gospel has a legendary and even exotic tone. And I gave you this page uh, which contains the first two chapters of Matthew's Gospel, just so that you might look it over later, or uh, for those of you who came early, before we started the presentation. And you'll see that the structure is entirely different from Luke's Gospel. And indeed, the purpose is not entirely different, but it has a significant difference. For example, in Matthew's Gospel, five different prophecies from Jewish scripture are discussed because they're thought to be fulfilled in Jesus. And there are five dreams which Joseph has, which structure the narrative. Joseph is the central agent and protector of the Holy Family against the murderous King Herod in Matthew's Gospel. The story of the Magi from the East searching for the newborn King of the Jews is told only by Matthew. It serves as the first act of Matthew's second chapter, 
and it has enchanted readers and artists through the ages. So is the second act in the second chapter, with its interrelated scenes of the flight into Egypt, the slaughter of the holy innocents, and the holy families return from Egypt. Perhaps the most frequently painted image of the incarnation is the adoration of the kings. And this is a marvelous, relatively small panel of the adoration by Hans Memling, the great uh, Flemish painter who uh, painted this triptych somewhere between 1470 and 1477, so relatively early in his maturity. He died in 1494. He was the great painter in the city of Bruges, a commercial center in Flanders, and uh, was for a time, at the beginning of the last century, the most prized artist in the world. If you'll notice, something particular about this triptych is that the space is continuous. The nativity, the adoration, the presentation, it, it is as though there were one great stage with different things happening on that one great stage. And indeed, it's the stage of the fulfillment of the prophecy that there will be a Messiah for Israel. This is the central panel enlarged. This is much larger than the painting itself, which is in the Alta Pinacothek in Munich, and which is, as hucksters say, worth the trip. <laughs> the, whole, the whole painting is maybe that big. And it is called the Pearl of Brabant. Pearl because it's very precious, but relatively small. What you see is the animals in the simple stable, but what is that in the background? That's not Bethlehem, that's Bruges. And the beautiful virgin with the child, the eldest of the three kings, reverencing the child's feet in adoration, a typical memling face. He painted extremely serene, oval-faced women very beautifully. Today, taste has changed and they are perhaps too serene for our taste. But at the beginning of the 20th century, people like J.P. Morgan would sell a house and buy the painting. He did not buy this painting. Uh, here there are onlookers. This is the second king, here portrayed as a king, and the third king who by 1470 is beginning to become traditional, that is to say a black king. And even earlier, it had been the tradition that there would be three, not magi or wise men from the east, but three kings. Matthew's Gospel does not say that there were three, it just says that there were magi, a kind of wise seeker for the truth who studied the sky and the stars not in a cheap sense of astrology, but in a sense of looking for signs of the way the world is being shaped. Because they brought three kings, uh, three pardon me, gifts according to Matthew, the association developed that there were three visitors and that they were kings. But Matthew does not say that, and so it's really better to refer to it, refer to them as magi, or perhaps wise men, from the east. There's also a version of this great, great painting in Bruges, but this is, I think, the best of the version, versions. That's 1470, 1477. Let's go back a little to see not the adoration, but what follows the adoration. After the, the Magi have discovered Jesus, Herod wants to know where he can find Jesus. And in a dream, Joseph is warned that Herod's intent is murderous. And so Herod, Joseph takes the family by night, according to the text, into Egypt. And this is, I'm sorry, it's, it's murky. I think this is 
a piece of Chartres glass before it was cleaned. But this is from the west front of the Cathedral of Chartres in the great lancet window to your right as you approach the west front, uh, the old front or facade, to your left if you're within the cathedral. The cathedral, uh, this glass came from the fourth cathedral on the site. The present church is the fifth. There was a terrible fire in 1194. <coughs> but this glass in the incarnation window, the central window, and then the window to the right I'm sorry, I said to the right as you approach the cathedral. It's in the center. To the right is the passion window. So if you're inside the cathedral, it's the central window that the light comes through. This, this window and the window to the left and the Jesse tree to the right and one other great piece of glass, the Belle Verrière, uh, was saved despite the fire and mounted again in the new cathedral. What you see here is very true to the gospel account, in this sense that it is utterly simple. Joseph, leading, took the child and his mother by night into Egypt. It became almost instantly traditional to have them, the mother and child, mounted on a donkey. But <coughs> it doesn't say that. All right. So this is a rondel. In reality, it would be about so big. Mm -hmm. uh, right next to it, also from 1155 or 60, is what? Well, if you've studied Matthew's Gospel very carefully, you'd have no idea what this is because it isn't in the Gospel. <laughs> but it does figure in a document that had enormous uh, influence in the early and later Middle Ages and well into uh, Baroque painting, the Gospel of Pseudo-Matthew, the exact date of which we don't know, it's somewhere between 4th and 8th century, and it has all sorts of wonderful stories, and we'll see some of them. None of them are true, but they're all delightful. This is the Holy Family arriving in the town in Egypt of Sotinen. The burghers of Chartres would have known what this was because they would have heard talks about it. And when the windows were put up, they would have had instruction and they would have passed this on. They, most of them wouldn't be able to read, but they would have heard the story. And this would be their book. Just a little bit later, about 1179, is another wonderful image in metal, in stone rather, pardon me, from the front door of the Duomo in Pisa. Uh, it's not from the front door, it's from the embrasure. And it's done by Bonanus of Pisa, 1179, and it's called The Flight into Egypt. <coughs> Joseph is a bit burdened, but for 1179, sculpted with great realism, the mother and the child mounted on the kind of miniature donkey, wouldn't you say? <laughs> they get their own little piece of road here to bring them out on the background of the sculpture. And this is a palm tree, which could just be a decorative element, but we'll hear more about that later. These wonderful rosettes that are outside the frame of the sculpture decorating it, and I wanted you I thought about cropping it just to the image, and I thought, no, the folks should see how fanciful the sculpture was. And this is typical in the sides of sculptures and windows and paintings at the time. There would be wonderful inventive decorations that had nothing strictly to do with the story, but were just decorative. In a way, it was a very Catholic merger of the story of faith and, pardon me, and a natural examination, a reasoned examination and appreciation for the natural world. This is by the great, great painter Duccio, and some of you know, a great favorite of mine, uh, from the Maya Star in Siena, and it shows 
two prophets whose prophecies Matthew's Gospel tells the fulfillment of, and Mary looking back to Joseph, who is guiding them, the child, the donkey. Don't you love his legs? Um, this was before very thin legs were considered mammals. And the guide who becomes more and more uh, typical, uh, though not mentioned in the, in the Gospel, fine. Uh, and the sleeping Joseph hearing the message from the angel to take the family into Egypt. This is a close-up of the central panel. Here you see the angel addressing Joseph in his dream. The people wouldn't understand the Latin, but the clergy would explain it to them. Uh, and the background really pretty elegant, isn't it? It's, it's, uh, it's a typical Sienese background. Uh, jagged, rough, uh, not really very much like the landscape around Siena, but a dramatization of it with these wonderful, elegant umbrella trees. Now, Duccio was uh, born, he was active from about 1379 until 1318. And he did this Mayasta, which means Our Lady in Majesty, uh, a very large piece uh, on commission from the cathedral. And he finished it in 1311, and it was carried from his studio to the cathedral to be placed behind the high altar. The whole town came out. It was the Macy's Parade for Siena of the day. <laughs> This would have been on the back side. The front side was just Mary in majesty, sitting on a wonderful, elaborate throne, with the child as the Lord and Savior in her lap, and looking over <coughs> the edges <coughs> of her throne are attendant angels. And where they are closest to Mary, they have the most beautiful, curious, looks on their faces. What does she look like? And how is the baby today? It is just enchanting, the most golden tenderness. And then around and beneath her are saints and the particular patrons of Siena. On the back of this very large piece are, is the life of Christ, with uh, leading up to the passion, which is the central panel. And this would have been there, this predella. This would have been even smaller, the whole Della would have been maybe that big, maybe less. Della would means a, a panel below the main image. <coughs> For many years, uh, Duccio was neglected because Vasari, who wrote the lives of the painters, didn't know the Maestà, and in fact attributed some of uh, Duccio's principal works to uh, Giotto. Well, why would you do that? Well, he was Florentine, and so was Giotto. And uh, he was prejudiced. So that's like every other historian. Are there any historians here? Sorry. <laughs> um, so he, um, he said, uh, but people don't know the so-called Maestà of Duccio. Siena is not a long distance from Florence, although it was then further away. Uh, but he just didn't bother to go to the cathedral to see the Maestà. There are therefore those of us who prefer Duccio to Giotto for various reasons. Here is a considerably later uh, painting, about 150 years later. You recognize who this is, don't you? Who, who will tell me? Did it? Well, who painted a blonde virgin with that clarity of skin and this beautiful child with that tender way she's holding him, gorgeous blue, brilliantly preserved red, but for Angelico? Again, in a local landscape which has become decidedly more undulant, more realistic, 
And along comes Joseph, uh, carrying a pail, uh, a, a flask, or a pilgrim's flask, a staff, coat thrown over it, blonde hair, blonde hair, blonde hair, just like all the other Jews in Bethlehem of the time. <laughs> And this is what Matthew says the angel said to Joseph. Rise, take Akipe, the boy Purim, and his mother, that's an abbreviation for Latin, et matrem, et, and fulge in Egyptum, which is just what the Bonanus of Pisa said in abbreviated form. So that's about 1450. Let's go forward uh, another 50 or so years, and we have the great, great <coughs> Albrecht Durer, uh, 1472 to 1528. And this is a marvelous etching in the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston from about 1504. I would like to have shown you uh, a piece of uh, Durer's from the, the Seven Sorrows of the Virgin, the flight into Egypt, which was painted just a, painted just a little bit earlier than this. It's in Dresden. It's a gorgeous painting. And the painting is the Seven Sorrows of the Virgin. But the only image of it I could get was so small that it didn't blow up reasonably, uh, expand reasonably. And the reason I wanted to show you that is that Durer realized that the flight into Egypt was one of the sorrows of the Virgin Mary. Uh, so far, you wouldn't have seen that this was sorrowful. You might intuit that or read it into it, but uh, the Duccio, uh, the Frangelico, don't make it look like a very difficult scene, though they do present it very simply with a fitting sobriety. But Jura recognized that this was a scene of sorrow. This, however, is certainly a great work. He was a marvelous uh, draftsman and brilliant at etching, and his etchings had enormous influence in Europe because they could move around. Uh, a painting would be painted for a patron or at a church, and it stayed there. But the etchings could move or be copied. So here we have Joseph once more leading the way. He's looking back at Mary and the child to see that they're all right. Uh, he's got more gear. Uh, she is now on a much sturdier donkey. They have brought uh, this very well rendered animal. He, he loved to draw and etch animals. And she's riding side saddle, looking pretty comfortable, and has gotten herself a really spiffy hat. <laughs> the palm tree suggests the actual locale, but much of the rest of the etching uh, could be the woods around Nuremberg, where he came from. And this etching would be about so big. Does anybody, can you see that? That is his uh, signature, a large A with the D under it. This is 1504, four years after <coughs> one of the greatest paintings ever done, his self-portrait in the year 1500, before which I've stood for hour after hour after hour. And if you go to look at it, he tells you, don't consider me just a craftsman. I am an artist and a person of distinction, like yourself, of course. Um, and why don't we talk a while? And it is, the, the, the face is so real. It's also redolent of Christ imagery. The hair is part of the center. It's long and curly on either side. Sensational, sensational painting. Here is the uh, painting that we used for the flyer, or that I should say Joan and her colleagues uh, beautifully put into the flyer. And it's called The Miracle of the Palm Tree on the Flight into Egypt. 
It's by a Castilian artist uh, between 1490 and 1510. We don't know his name. And it was probably, it, it was from a retabla, a large wooden decorative piece that would be behind the altar. And we think it was from the Cathedral of La Calhora in Logroño in Castile. The, uh, this is large. This is, well actually, the image you see is maybe a little larger than the actual piece, which is in the Metropolitan Museum in the main, the medieval sculpture hall, where the Christmas tree now is. <coughs> and uh, if you go down to see the Christmas tree, it'll be just to your left as you look at the Christmas tree. It's on the wall towards the south wing of the museum. It's obviously Mary on her now rather small. Donkey isn't quite as big as Mary. Uh, well, he has he had limited space to work with. The child, uh, Joseph is reaching up. I think, and people at the cloisters think that they are angels. Why don't they have wings? Well, the mark, consistency is the mark of small minds. And we don't have to have wings on all angels, I guess. This is a detail. Uh, is in wonderful condition and so is the polychrome. He's got blue eyes and blonde hair. She's got blue eyes and blonde hair. Um, you can see that he has a beautifully patterned brocade tunic. She has again a gold top, a patterned tunic, and then a beautiful cloak with a gold border. He looks disinterested because he's given the command that is of importance and she looks at him with a slightly apprehensive look what is he up to now <laughs> and this is Joseph this detail shows you uh, some of the richness of his robe with the gold cuff and again a brocaded tunic a gold cape with a red lining and this is the whole piece <coughs> There is some damage to her left hand. Those two fingers are damaged, but otherwise it's in remarkable condition and remarkably lifelike. The, uh, look at how he got her knees and her little foot there to suggest her whole body. It's, it's high relief, that is to say it's not fully rounded. It's carved out of a, a background piece so that it's about three quarters freestanding. The story is, the legend of the miracle of the palm tree from Pseudo Matthew is that on their trip they were hungry and Jesus commands the palm tree to bend with its fruit so they may eat it. And Joseph is reaching up. He looks a little bit more Jewish than Mary and the child. He reaches up to pick the golden figs while the angels assist in the bending of the tree. Notice the composition. It's really an extraordinary feat of composition. The tree, which is essential to the story, also becomes an arch framing the story and enclosing it, while the ground encloses it from the bottom, allowing the empty space, what contemporary sculptures call negative space, to give the whole piece greater depth, greater movement, movement, greater uh, dynamism. So it's, it's folkloric, of course, but it's also very sophisticated in its feel for uh, dramatizing the scene. This is about the same time, maybe a few years later. It's by Gerard David, the great um, Flemish sculptor, who, a, a painter, who after Memling's death became the primary, the greatest painter in Bruges. And the Metropolitan has more works by David than any uh, museum in the world. This is called The Rest on the Flight into Egypt. And this is an aspect of the flight into Egypt which became increasingly dominant 
so that if you see a, you see in the catalog of a museum a painting called The Flight into Egypt, it's more than likely to be a scene of the rest. Mary with the face rather like Memling's, you see the same oval, <coughs> serene face, is suckling the child, wearing this gorgeous blue cloak over an interior tunic with a red tunic beneath that. Uh, this is the real flight. And this is not a Jerusalem that they're fleeing, but again, Bruges. The landscape is beautifully done. And uh, once he did one of these, it was clear that he had a, a special uh, place and he would mine it or use it continually. This is perhaps 1515, about the same time, a few years earlier maybe, is this painting. Did anybody hazard a guess as to who it is? Well, doesn't the composition remind you of Raphael? And even here in the half smile, in the spumato, the, the uh, smoky way that the city is painted in the distance, and the smoky way the robe is painted, Leonardo. But it is, in fact, Fra Bartolomeo. And it comes from the Getty. It's about 1509. His name was Bartolomeo di Pagolo. 1472 to 1517. He's also known as Baccio della Porta because while he was studying with Cosimo Roselli, he lived in a house right near the gate of the city and got that name, della Porta. He was influenced by an assistant of Roselli named Piero di Cosimo. Uh, in a previous lecture, I've shown you a wonderful piece by Piero di Cosimo, St. John the Baptist, the patron of Florence. But he was also influenced by Ghirlandaio and Filippino Lippi. Uh, he was very attracted to the severe teaching of Savonarola and painted a great portrait of Savonarola in 1498, the one we know Savonarola best by. He became a Dominican friar in 1500 and entered San Marco, Frangelico's monastery, in 1501. Raphael visited Florence in 1508, so if you sensed something of Raphael, it's because when he came to Florence about 1508, the year before this painting, he met the older painter, and Bartolo, Fra Bartolomeo learned from Raphael a great deal about perspective, light, and color. So this may well have been painted under the immediate influence of, of Raphael. What is new here, an element that we haven't seen before at all? Well, John the Baptist, uh, who does not figure in Matthew's Gospel, which alone tells the story of the flight into Egypt, until chapter 3. But never mind. It's too dear to paint the Lord's cousin, giving him, as a friendly gesture, a cross. And so the grouping of the Holy Family with John becomes increasingly traditional, though it is beside the point of the Gospel. But where is the real flight here? It's embarrassing, this flight thing. Way off in the corner. Um, just about this time, perhaps a few years later, is the next image I'll show you. It's by Joachim Patanir, and it's called Rest on the Flight of Egypt. It's from the Prado, which is a great, great museum in Madrid, which has more Patanir than any other museum. Patanir did not do many paintings. Uh, the landscape, which was Patanir's real interest, is by Patanir. The Virgin is by an assistant. She is again in this blindingly white robe, suckling the child, while Joseph looks for 
food and the donkey waits over here. In the distance are stories from pseudo, well, partly from the gospel and partly from pseudo Matthew. I don't think you, think you can make it out. But over here is the massacre of the Holy Innocents. This is called the miracle of the wheat field as the soldiers of Herod, according to pseudo Matthew, chased the Holy Family on their way to Egypt. They came upon some peasants and said, did you see a young family? Yes, and when were they here? Well, when we were cutting our field. But the field had miraculously grown up, so the soldiers were deceived as to the time of their passing. <coughs> but once you hear that story, you want to paint it, even if it has nothing to do with the real gospel. And up here, hard to make out, are the falling of the idols as the Holy Family passed by. Titian, of course, wanted to paint the scene, and I apologize for the quality of the image, but this is Titian uh, very early, 1508, at the time when he was painting the Feast of the Gods with Giorgione. He, he died in the 1570s, so this is very early. But his genius is already apparent in terms of the treatment of the figures, brilliant use of color, uh, but do you notice she gets better and better garbed? Uh, it's now not the handsome tunic and cloak we've seen in several, but silks. And good old Joseph gets dressed up too. And their, their guide is now a page. And there are beautiful animals and picnickers in the field as they make their way, not into a place of exile, but to a royal excursion or something like that. And this is the doozy of all the pictures I have to show you. <laughs> Isn't that a howler? <laughs> this is early Caravaggio, 1595, 1597. It's from the Dori Pamphilia Palace in uh, Rome. And typical Caravaggio, the woman is gorgeous, the child is, look at her hand. And untypical in that these figures are quite refined. The Joseph is more typical, but this is early Caravaggio. You know, he used models from the street, very ordinary people whose fingernails would be dirty and faces weren't scrubbed and might have slight disfigurements, but they were real people. Very <coughs> typical is the bare feet. Um, I won't comment on the secureness of the angel's guard. It looks like one of those, you know, if you pull the right string, we have a nude angel. And he's playing the violin. He has played them to sleep. And Joseph is dutifully, dutifully holding the sheet music. And the sheet music, it can be read if you magnify it. The painting itself is about so big. But if you magnify this so further, it's quam pulcraes, and it was written by Noel Baldivin. Quam pulcraes, how beautiful you are, is a tribute to Mary, taking from the Song of Songs. Well, once you know about this painting, and you get a captive audience, you want to show it, don't you know? <laughs> the theme of the entertaining angels is continued. But here it's a lute, and the lutist is accompanied by two other angels. The child is asleep. The mother is concerned. Um, the robes are beautifully painted. Joseph in the mood of reverie. The sky somewhat threatening. And this is an unknown castle by which they've taken a rest. This is from the studio of Giovanni Francesco Barbieri called Il Gercino, because he had a squint. And it's about 1640, so 40 or so years later than the Caravaggio, but with the same theme of the entertaining angels. And I chose it for many reasons. First of all, the theme of the music being played for the family, and especially Mary and the child, but also become, because it comes from a university museum, Loyola University Museum of Art in Chicago, many institutions of higher learning colleges and universities have very good painting collections that deserve to be better known. 
here is another take uh, on the whole theme, and this is a little bit early, earlier than the Guercino studio. Mother and child, ladies of the court, Chamberlain of the King, no, two saints, St. George, his standard, uh, attendant angels, playing with the lamb of John the Baptist, and in the background, this gorgeous landscape. It can only be Rubens, and that is who it is. Here's a fascinating painting by Adam Elsheimer, who lived very briefly, died at 32, 1578 to 1610, and it's called The Flight into Egypt, Night Scene, done perhaps a year before his death in 1610. It's from the Alta Pinacothek in uh, Munich, where that great self-portrait of uh, Durer is. He painted on copper. The, the actual painting would be much smaller than this, perhaps so big. He painted with oil on copper, which gave the paintings a, a brilliance. And he was very painstaking. He painted very slowly. There are very few pieces. There's one small painting by him in America. Um, and was chided by a number of his senior artists who valued his talent greatly. He was a master of light. And you notice here the multiple sources of light which do not conflict with each other. The sky is gorgeous, the Milky Way, the moon, the principal source of light for the scene, reflected in the lake, the holy family with a lantern that has just made its way along towards an encampment where they hope to have some shelter. For, for the small amount he did, Alzheimer had great influence, including influence on Rembrandt. Rembrandt was born just about the time Alzheimer died, and this is his flight into Egypt night scene, one of his great nocturnes, done in 1647. It's in the National Gallery in Dublin, and Scene is probably shortly before dawn. Mary and Joseph huddled by the fire, the child playing by the fire. Uh, unlikely if they fled immediately after the child's birth, but how could you resist placing the child in that playful attitude and also warming attitude by the water with this gorgeous reflection? 1647, so Rembrandt is entering on his last and major phase. Here's a painting uh, of the flight that I'd like you to look at and see if you can identify it. It's about 100 years later than the Rembrandt, about 1750, 1760. There are clues. Well, it's Mexican. It's a great piece of colonial art by Miguel Cabrera, who was with Cristobal de Villapando, the greatest painter of colonial Mexico. It again comes from a university museum, uh, the museum at Marquette, and I show it because of that partly, it's from a school, but also because it's a very good painting. There have been a number of exhibitions in the last decade or so arguing that, even more, 15 years, arguing that colonial art of Latin America uh, was not simply derivative imitation of European art, but that there were significant talents of great uh, creativity and originality and these two painters, Cristobal de Lopondo and Miguel Cabrera, were among them. Uh, remember Durer's virgin with the lovely hat? Well, here she's put it on. <laughs> and the child tugs at his mother's veil, a gesture that goes back to Duccio. If you go to the Met and you go up to the first Italian gallery, you'll see that great, great little tiny painting 
of the mother and child. And the child is pulling the mother's veil aside so he can see her face. It's the first place you should go when you go to the Met. He's pulling at her veil, he's reaching down to the man he knows as his father, who has this tender expression on his face, quite sentimental, but he is taking care of them. It's not weak sentimentality, it's just feeling. And the angel, uh, if you've seen colonial art, you recognize almost immediately, that's, that's a Latin American angel. It's also a compendium of the legendary material. This is the palm tree that we saw before, but now it has clear angels in it, three of them. This is another legend that at the foot of the palm tree, a spring arose to give the Holy Family uh, clear drinking water. And here, idols are falling off pillars as they pass by. This is about 1750, 1760. This is about 10 years later. And this is by the great Giambattista Tiepolo, the Venetian artist uh, who dominated the 18th century. His son, Domenico, was also a very good artist, not quite as good as his father, not at all as good as his father, but a good artist. And Tiepolo could draw like an angel, quickly beautifully, fluidly, with, as though the, the, what he was drawing would fly off the page. They have crossed the lake from a, <laughs> doesn't look much like Israel, does it? <laughs> but it's very attractive in the background. They've crossed the lake with this uh, porter who was bowing in reverence, his hands folded in prayer. The angel who has accompanied them now that they've reached the further shore, is bowing in reverence before this gorgeously painted girl, mother, queen, who could look haughty, but is not meant to. And there is Joseph. Uh, look at this cliff, which becomes like a sculpture erected in honor of their arrival but it's just a piece of natural scenery. And look at how much of a canvas is just the sky, and how beautifully this pale blue meets the darker blue of the Virgin's robe. It's, this is a painting, the slide comes from a painting, but there uh, was also, there was also a, uh, there is also a pastel of it which is how I first met it and fell in love with it. Um, well, the legendary material which accrued more and more to uh, the images of the flight into Egypt uh, made them more and more interesting in many ways. The art was often sublime, but the theology was less so. For the flight into Egypt, for Joseph taking the child and his mother away from the designs of a murderous king, uh, was by no means an idyllic excursion, accompanied by attendant angels and falling idols. It was a poor young family's desperate escape from a tyrant king who was portrayed realistically, if not with exact historicity, as of ordering the slaughter of all the male children of Bethlehem. Joseph, the child, and his mother fled, in fact, as refugees to Egypt, a place of shelter and abundance, but one with ambiguous significance for the people of Israel. The journey can only be imagined as perilous in the extreme. Once arrived, how could Joseph have cared for the child and his mother, except as a kind of migrant worker? What food, what shelter, what hope would there have been at first for them? So what image might there be to show how Mary felt being taken 
in flight into Egypt. I think you all know this incredible image by Dorothea Lang. I don't know whether my young friends in the gallery know this picture, but this is by a woman named Dorothea Lang who worked for the Farm Security Administration taking photographs. She worked throughout her career taking some photographs with increasing interest in social issues. But in the midst of the Depression, she did some of her very best work. And this is called Migrant Mother, done in 1936. Uh, the, the, the title is traditional, but she, she used it only loosely. Uh, she was an incredibly sympathetic woman. Uh, she had polio at seven, and uh, it injured her right leg. She lived all her life. Uh, she married twice, had children. She led a full life, but she was marked by acuity of social vision and acuity of personal feeling. She took five exposures of Florence, Owens, Thompson, and this has become the most famous. The young family had, it's 1936, the young family had a tent they were living in at the time. They scraped desperately for food. There was no reliable food supply, which is what you'd imagine for the Holy Family fleeing into Egypt. How do you feel about her? Sadness, concern, but I don't think pity. She's too strong. And however much it hurts to see her predicament, don't you feel she's going to get through it? This is one strong woman for all the uh, anguish in her face. The photograph has this incredible simplicity. The children are looking away. You know she has those two little youngsters to take care of. Had they been looking toward us, you'd look at them proudly. But as it is, you look with her, and you look out into the distance wondering where will help come from. This, in fact, is a third child. I don't know how often I've seen this image. I decided to use it for this slideshow two months ago. It was the first slide I thought of after I thought of the miracle, the legend of the miracle of the palm tree, or the miracle of the palm tree on the flight into Egypt from the Met. The next thing I thought of was, well, with that goes realism. And only last Saturday night, at a party at the home of a woman who has a number of lying photographs on a wall in her apartment, that I stand in front of this and say, oh my gosh, there's a child. And I asked a few of the other guests, and one said, no, there's no child. And the other said, well, of course there's a child. And so I went to look up uh, Lang's work, and of the five exposures, in the five exposures, there were a couple of shots of the family where there's clearly the two four and five-year-olds, perhaps, and the infant. Here's another woman who shares a lot with Mary. This is a refugee woman in Kenya who's been, obviously, because of all that's been accumulated, in her shelter for a good while. She's at the Kakuma Refugee Camp, a modest-sized city of 90,000 in the desert of northwest Kenya, which houses Sudanese, Ethiopian, and Somalian refugees mostly, but also Congolese, Burundians, Rwandans, and Ugandans. It was founded 19 years ago. The refugees cannot leave it without permission. And so it is at once a sanctuary and a prison. 
administered by the United Nations High Commission on Refugees. I want to suggest that unless we appreciate the desperation that's inherent in Matthew's story, we cannot grasp the full import of the families being called out of Egypt. In fact, the story of the flight into Egypt is the story of a new exodus. As Moses was saved from Pharaoh's wrath and then led his people from persecution towards the promised land, so Jesus escapes Herod but returns as the newborn Messiah of his people, king in a far truer sense than Herod could ever be. Not that he returns immediately in glory, rather, his ministry of redemption germinates for many years. When he enters upon it, he finds not only disciples, but ardent enemies who will eventually drag him to an excommunicating form of death outside the city. The flight into Egypt thus foreshadows the full humiliation that Jesus would experience on the cross. And to whom can it speak with more severe comfort than to the millions upon millions of immigrants, refugees, and displaced persons in today's world? The United Nations High Commission for Refugees counts 15.2 million <coughs> refugees and 51 million internally displaced persons. Their plight of displacement, homelessness, lack of sure shelter, disruption of family life, abusive treatment, is a plight shared in his first days by the child born to be their savior. Let me show you a last suite of images that deal, I think, somewhat more effectively with this severe realism in Matthew's Gospel. This is a painting that were it not for the hour, I would leave up there for a full minute or two before <coughs> saying anything about it, because it fairly says, look at me, look. It's by Henry Asawa Tanner, a great black painter, who was born in 1859 and lived until 1937, a student of Thomas Aikens, a wonderful painter, who painted in the United States, felt uh, the oppression that his people felt, uh, went to live in France, had an early great success in France when he painted a painting called The Resurrection of Lazarus in 1897, which was a huge hit with the Paris Salon. And even then, even with this great success, suffered the indignity of the following. He tells the story that when a Baltimore newspaper heard that a colored man had been greatly honored at the Paris Salon, it wanted a picture of him. This is, this is at least according to Tanner what happened. So the Baltimore newspaper sent out a photographer to photograph the first black dock hand they saw, and that was Mr. Tanner. You can imagine why he didn't come home readily. He did, however, come home, among other things, because his talent was recognized and he had some great artist friends. But he went back finally <coughs> to live uh, in the early 1900s, almost the whole rest of his life. He came back for occasional exhibitions here in Paris. And there, uh, on a trip to the Barbizon, the town of Barbizon, south of Paris, where the Barbizon painters painted, he met a wonderful woman, Jessie Macaulay Olson, who was white from a fairly uh, comfortable family. Uh, they fell in love and had a remarkably happy marriage. Uh, she appreciated his art. He loved her deeply. They had one son. And uh, when uh, she died, uh, she had the most tender thing. Uh, she told somebody at her deathbed, he never did anything I didn't love. He didn't read just the paintings, of course. Well, this is called The Flight into Egypt, and it's painted in 1923. 
It's from the Met, and it's about this big. Here's his signature. Um, it's not now on ordinary display because the American wing is being done over, but it's in what's called visible storage. So if you want to go to see it, you have to go to the American wing to the loose center. And in the loose center, there are tightly packed hanging places for paintings, and they're all under glass, but you can see it. They're all crammed together, but you can see it. It's unfortunately behind a mullion of the glass, which interrupts the picture, but you can see it, and it will one day go back in a place of honor in the museum. They are entering a town outside, uh, uh, outside Israel, probably in Egypt, although that's not certain, and it need not be. They come through this gate with this beautiful lightish blue sky, the dark side inside the town, the brown gate, the arched, Moorish arched doorways. He had made a trip to Tangier in 1911, 1912, just the time that Henri Matisse went there and was greatly impressed by the architecture and the colors and the light and reworked some of his sketches from Tangier for this painting. Moorish um, doorways. The only source of light, he was a master of light, is the guide, this Bernus, the guide's lantern. We don't see his face. Joseph with a white head, scarf, blue coat, Mary, very indistinct but clearly very tender on a full-size donkey, although this is the donkey. This is the shadow, which does several things. It gives depth to the picture. It suggests the slightly uncanny, a larger donkey in shadow than in reality, and the path forwards towards who knows what. <coughs> Tanner, he had two favorite subjects. He painted portraits and landscapes and genre scenes. His most famous painting is called The Evangelist of 1893, in which a black man is teaching a black boy to play the banjo. It is wonderful, and it represents the warm relationship between Tanner's father and himself, among other things. His father was an African Methodist Episcopal bishop, and he loved his father and admired him. He was one of the eldest of seven children, by the way. Uh, so he loved his father, admired him, and that is behind this wonderful picture of a man teaching a child to play a banjo. It was appreciated not for the best of reasons, although gradually for the best of reasons. It was appreciated because here's a black man teaching a child to play, and isn't that cute? Then it was realized that it was really a terrific painting. Uh, but he had two favorite biblical images. One was the Good Shepherd, which he painted more than 15 times, and the other was the flight into Egypt. And he explicitly said, um, this biblical scene is something that my people understand from their insides, because they too have had to fly. Very briefly, this is James Lassane Wells, 1902 to 1993. It's 1931, so a little bit later than the Tanner. Um, he uh, studied at Columbia, and while at Columbia, he went to an exhibition of African sculpture at the Brooklyn Museum, was bowled over, and he was also very influenced by Durer, woodcuts, and by German expressionist woodcuts. So his style is clearly expressionist. This is by no means a sad flight or a harried flight, but neither is it jubilant. Joseph is trudging along. Um, he specialized in linoleum woodcuts, was hired for the Har uh, Howard uh, faculty, and uh, died in, with considerable repute. Like, like uh, Tanner, but even more so. He was a very handsome man. And this is a tougher painting. This is Jacob Lawrence. Uh, the great uh, African-American painter, 1917 to 2000. 
And here is an image of flight that has the danger of being violent. This is, this is called Forward from 1967, and it's from the Harriet Tubman series. Uh, Lawrence became famous in 1940 when he did 62 small panels about so big, no, about so big, in very bold, geometrically abstracted but realistic uh, forms and colors of the migration of blacks from the south to the north, the great cities of the north, for employment and opportunity. And it was published in Time magazine, and he became instantly the most famous uh, African-American artist in America. The modern, <coughs> the, uh, the modern Museum bought half of them, and the, uh, the uh, Phillips Museum in Washington bought the other half, so they can exhibit them sometimes separately, sometimes together. So Harriet Tubman led other slaves to freedom out of the South and carries this gun. Well, of course. And she's urging this black man on, followed by a black woman with a child and two other men. The conditions of such persecution can lead to violence. A lighter and, in fact, lyrical image is by a Japanese artist, uh, Sadao Watanabe. And this is the flight into Egypt, 1982. It's one of several versions. He did many, many versions. He was a Christian artist in Japan. And he specialized in biblical prints in the minge, or folk art, tradition of Japan. Let me just point out, it too would be much smaller. That's his name. Um, it has the same basic composition of a lot of images we saw, but it takes the story into an Asian frame of reference without making it only Asian. I love the way he looks back to see how things are going. I love the little child asleep, presumably, and a little donkey. Here is another and still more lightsome image. Some of you know the name of John August Swanson, born in 1938. He studied under Karita Kent, by the way. And this is part of three panels, the Nativity, the Adoration, and the Flight into Egypt. That's his name. As I was putting this together at the Met, the woman I was working with said, it's uh, copyrighted, Father. Uh, do you want to show this? And I said, uh, can you show this? And she said, do you want to show this? <laughs> <laughs> You're not going to tell, right? <laughs> so it's, it's very lighthearted and uh, uh, folkloric again, and uh, united each of the panels, every one over here, one over here, has these angels in it, the starry skies uniting it. But I thought, well, some of these folks may have seen Swanson before or remembered at least Karita Ketch. Let me come back to an image that I showed you at the beginning without commenting. By now, you, you realize where I'm going, don't you? <laughs> to me, this is the flight into Egypt. This is the panic and the fear and the haste and the loneliness and the need. But it's not painting of the flight into Egypt. What is it? It's called A Ride to Liberty, The Fugitive Slaves. Well, what were the Jewish people in Egypt except enslaved and persecuted? This is by Eastman Johnson, a mid-19th century American painter, a great portraitist, and a man who did some of the most sympathetic but also extremely refined portraits of black Americans at the time. And this is an event that he witnessed near the Manassas Battlefield in Virginia, Manassas Battlefield, the Civil War, 1862. The young family is fleeing from the Confederate lines across the open battlefield 
in the dull light of early dawn towards the Union lines and freedom. Notice that their faces are all in profile. It adds to the tension. The horse is at full gallop. It adds to the tension. The ground is not painted with any particular particularity. It's roughly done. They're moving too fast for the ground to be observable. It all adds to this atmosphere of fear. And I just think it's wonderful. When I first saw it, perhaps 10 years ago, and it's at the Brooklyn Museum, I thought, now that is, first of all, a fine painting. And it captures a moment we should never forget. That doesn't mean, that doesn't mean that you can't love, that you can't love the legend or the miracle of the palm tree on the flight into Egypt. And I certainly encourage you to go and see it at your earliest opportunity. It's just a wonderful piece. But I think this painting is much closer to the gospel and much closer to the realism we need about the scenes of the Christmas story told in one way by Luke, told in another way by Matthew. The realism we need if we're not going to be swamped by the commercialism of the season. We cannot fight the commercialism that has invaded us, but we can go back to the gospel. We have the gospel. And we have great artists like this man, Henry Osawa Tanner, who gave us an image that is beautiful to look at, mystical, and compelling, begging because of its beauty and depth that we contemplated. <coughs> so I conclude by suggesting that we may delight in the artistic invention of countless flights into Egypt. But we should watch to see where brothers and sisters of Jesus are today in flight and humbly remember in our celebration of God with us that he too left his homeland as a child and then as an adult while seeking an everlasting home for us all. Thank you.